Thank you so much for the kind introduction, the kind words. Great pleasure to be here. And um, uh, yes, the, the title, I, you know, coming down here, I was, came down in the car, and I thought, you know, there's nothing no more annoys me when I was young to hear, you know, old people saying, oh God, I've heard that before, I've heard that for, you know, 30 years ago. Anyway, now I am an official old fart, I'm going to say it. I, it's, uh, maybe some of you remember this one. I remember going to lectures 40 years ago on drugs and how we should need to communicate the benefits and harms in a balanced way. And there was a meeting at the RCP in 90, oh well it must be in 1890 or something like that, it felt <laughs> like, feels like that anyway, and that was being discussed. This topic, I mean, I wonder how many times at society, in society meetings, somebody has given a talk with a similar title. So I feel almost embarrassed in dragging this stuff out again. Um, but no, one more push. It can be done, is what I want to claim. So, I, I, I don't know, I'd like to try to bring a little bit of um, enthusiasm into this argument, into this discussion. Okay, that's me. Um, I'm D. Spiegel on Twitter. Um, you know, a bit of background. I'm, I'm paid by Winton Capital Management, or hedge fund in Dowmey, because nobody would actually pay me uh, to do this sort of stuff. So, um, I'm, I'm extremely uh, grateful for that, to be the object of charity. I do recommend it. Um, and we've got a website, Understanding Uncertainty. That's going offline soon for reasons that I'll uh, describe. I'm Professor Risk on YouTube. I do a lot of school stuff. I do a lot of, you know, I've done some TV. I've done all sorts of things like that. But never mind. And um, as was mentioned, you know, I did do this book recently, Stats, uh, Sex by Numbers. Um, it took a long time to write. It took a long, long time to choose the cover. That was going to be the cover. <laughs> Yeah, not bad. Quite quick, quite quick. It's like my little test of an audience about how awake they are, how could they, yeah. So I said, but no, it really was going to be the cover. And then uh, this was done jointly with the Welcome Collection, and they said, no, 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 no. Couldn't possibly have that, couldn't possibly have that. So that was it. That was gone, that cover's gone. It was a real shame. I thought it was rather good. Um, okay. Um, why bother the community? I mean, I'm, uh, I'm a statistician. I've done some cleverish things in the past, but I don't do them anymore. So I've, I've become really obsessed about this, I'm, but I, what I really enjoy is communicating, you know, just trying to explain stuff. And it infuriates me when it's done either badly and competently or done in order to try to manipulate people. And it's the same, I used to get really annoyed by incompetence, and now it's the second one that's annoying me even more. I can sort of forgive incompetence, because I think there is a, a real duty to communicate well. And I could be talking about um, doctors talking to their patients. I could be talking about politicians talking to the public. I could be talking... I don't care, actually. You know, anyone who's got some... A scientist, anyone who's got some knowledge, whatever like that, has an ethical duty to communicate well. And as particularly if you are someone with expertise and other people are trying to make an informed choice to contribute to that idea. We'll come back to that in a minute. Let's change, in particularly in the health world, towards informed choice and what we're going to do about it. Um, I, I, this is other idea, you know, just to try to make the world more realistic to people, to actually point out, for example, in your area, you know, drugs might actually have, you know, side effects or harms. You know, they're not universal, you know, positive things. They don't work for everybody. Maybe we can educate professionals. Maybe we can empower public and networks. You know, maybe actually change the the power structures in society. Even this is the one I really like: encourage immunity to misleading anecdote. Now, this is the tyranny of the internet and the, and the discussion group, the, the, uh, you know, which has taken over from the sort of garden fence and the, and the, and the laundrette, perhaps, as a source of misleading anecdote that, that we all get. And uh, there's no, this is an official term, and a group of American psychologists well, are really basing all their risk communication work on trying to breed immunity to misleading animals. And doing it with that with randomized trials, showing that if you produce things in, the, in good formats, the sort of thing I'm going to be talking about today, that people are less influenced by stupid stories that they hear. You know, oh, I did this and my cancer went away or something like that. So th I think that's really important. But number th th what you're not trying to do, what I claim you're not trying to do, is to try to influence audiences towards a predetermined attitude or behavior, what I call coercive, manipulative, biased, unbalanced, whatever. And you might say, oh, well, of course we wouldn't want to do that. Whoa, 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 whoa. Everybody wants to do that. Everyone is always trying to persuade somebody. And whenever they use an, I want you to test this. Listen to the Today program when a number is being used, or World of One or anything like that. Whenever a number comes up, that number will be made, told in a way to make it look big or small to try to persuade you to something. It's not trying to inform you. 
He's trying to persuade you, to coerce you, to arouse your emotion, to make something feel, oh, that's really important, that's really worrying, that's really anxious. And that's the four standard form of communication of, of numbers and a lot of scientific evidence. And I've had enough. I've had enough. I'm old enough now. I've had enough of it. So the crucial role of it, I think trust is, I might as well get to the crux of the matter first, or trust is the, the is so important of all of this. And I won't talk about Brexit, I won't talk about current debates about, you know, whether we want to listen to experts, whatever, but I think we, we would agree that, you know, uh, a, a lack of trust of what we might consider expertise in society is a pretty bad thing. This is not going to be helpful for a future society. So uh, Honora O'Neill, I'm a huge fan of her, is very good, although she's got the brain the size of a planet with her as a philosopher, of bringing things down to some very sort of pithy little um, statements. So she says, trust, there's three aspects to trust. that We, we need competence. So these are very useful things. If you see something, and you think, do I trust this organisation? So I do it, for example, to Fox News, competence. So there's Fox News' idea of a pie chart, <laughs> yeah, which, which is not great. And that's just sheer incompetence. They just don't know what they're doing. OK, so they failed that one. Well, OK, what about the next one? Honesty. Well, let's try Fox News on honesty, shall we? Um, this is Fox News' idea of how to draw a graphic comparing <laughs> 6 million to 7 million when they want to make the difference look really big. So they cut the axis. So that's not very honest. What's interesting is when they did that, it was so obviously outrageous. They, get, they really got complete. And they actually said sorry. They said, oh, sorry, it's been a mistake. So they tried to say they were incompetent rather than dishonest, and they changed it. They changed it to that. Yeah, actually, maybe not. Because the nice thing about Honora O'Neill's criteria, the third one is reliability. Do people, you know, keep on you know, acting in a reliable way? Well, actually, Fox News are enormously reliable. Um, because they always do this for the every <laughs> graph that they do. So they get the tick on that one. They're reliably dishonest, whatever they do. Whatever they do. So, OK, Fox News, pretty easy to tick off on those. But those are quite useful criteria to work through anything, any, anybody who's trying to tell you anything, to work through. OK, balanced communication of numbers. As I said, the, the crucial thing about numbers is that almost always they're told in a way, they're framed in a way to try to make you look Look, whoa, because 350 million pounds on the side of a bus. I think I took the picture out, but I usually put that picture up there. You know, that's a classic use of a number, you know, to, to, my, to influence our feelings and things like that. So, um, and the crucial thing about this is, is framing. What do I mean by framing? Um, that's one of my favourite examples of framing. A very sort of um, innocuous one. This was the 99% campaign. I took that on um, London Underground. It says 99% of young Londoners do not commit serious youth violence. So it's a positively framed message. OK, now, the, the two things, you, uh, tricks you want to do to any number you hear like that, do two things. Turn it into a negative frame, and then if you want to make it look really bad, turn it into numbers of people. So those are the two tricks if you want to turn a good message into a bad message. So let's do that. So that means that 1% of young Londoners do commit serious youth violence. OK, that doesn't still sound too bad. But let's look at the population of London. There's about 8 million, so that's about a million between 15 and 24. So that's about a million young Londoners. 1% of a million is 10,000. Oh, my God. 10,000, you know, violent young maniacs in the roving this city. <laughs> Easily rewrite this post. Just so there's two tricks. The turning it into an absolute number in a big group makes it look much more impressive than just quoting percentages. So just remember, well, I, mean, I shouldn't be teaching this stuff, but you, know, you ought to at least know what everybody's doing, because this is what you do if you want to make a number look big. Um, I, I love spotting these. They're so delightful, the positive and negative frames. This, again, was a positively framed message, um, a, an immensely dull paper in Nature Genetics. 10% of people, have, with about 400 authors as usual, 10% of people have a genetic variant that reduces the risk of high blood pressure. Oh, yes, nice positively framed message. No coverage whatsoever until a genius press officer got hold of it. And uh, research has shown that the press officers are responsible for the majority of scientific misunderstandings and exaggerations <coughs> in the media. That's the current research has, has shown that. Okay, so a genius press officer, who I'm sure got a medal for at the uh, press officers' um, guild, uh, said, oh, this means that nine in 10 people carry a gene, which increases the chance of high blood pressure. Is that genius? Well, around the world, headlines, pay rise. So um, I, uh, that's so clever, really. You just take a, a negative, just try it all the time in your head. In the US, 2% of people have diet, adult heart surgery. 
well, that's not, you know. But in Britain, 98% of people survive. So it's much better. So it's just flip the numbers and the emotional aspect changes. And I, I mean, I, I won't show the examples I've been involved. Actually, I will show one later <laughs> that I've been involved in that does this deliberately. Okay, so I'm, I'm almost feeling embarrassed at dragging out the killer bacon sandwich story again. <laughs> but it is such a good one to, to illustrate the way in which um, handled badly, numbers can just be, uh, end up with completely giving the wrong impression. And this was the story from last year. Right, IARC um, reported, and they were, just all they did was they wrote one of their fat monographs saying that um, processed meat was now in the same um, uh, category as cigarettes in terms of the evidence for its carcinogenicity. They didn't say anything about how carcinogenic it was. So it's all to do with hazard. It's nothing to do with risk. Hazard is, is the potential to cause harm. Risk is the actual capacity, you know, the, the actual harm that might be caused in routine use. Um, nothing to do with risk. It was all to do with hazard. However, IARC are so incompetent with their communications and their public relations. They're so arrogant and was this being filmed? <laughs> they, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> they are so. I, 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 oh, who cares? They're so hopeless that um, this this is the sort of headline that happened, and the WHO and they spent they spent days trying to correct the impression that had been given. And um, the point is that you know eventually it becomes clear that 50 grams of processed meat a day is associated with an 18 percent lifetime increase of bowel cancer. Now, whether you actually believe that number, or not, I think it's probably not. You know, probably roughly right. Okay, so the, the crucial question for that is, do we care? Do we care? Um, now, what we're trying to talk about here, the crucial lesson which we're trying to get into schools, I'll talk a bit about that later, school syllabus, school kids, every school kid should see a story like that and say, what's the baseline risk? I cannot know how important that is without knowing how many people get bowel cancer in the first place. Every school kid should have that thumped into their head to know that around, and then they can go on to CRUK website, because nobody, um, IARC didn't tell us this, nobody else tells us this at all. You have to go on to separate website, CRUK, to see that 6% of people will get bowel cancer anyway. These use of relative risks is a well-known manipulative frame for communicating risk. It's been shown in endless studies, psychological studies, it is the worst way to fairly communicate risks is through hazard ratios or numerical or relative risks. So what we're talking about is an 18% relative increase over six percentage points. Okay, answers like, I know of no journalist who can do that without checking it with a statistician. They cannot do it. I mean, they should be able to just go to the sources and do this themselves. I know of not a single one who can do that on their own without checking. And it's such a shame because it's such an easy sum to do. It's such an easy sum to do. You just say, okay, according to CI UK, um, 100 people are like you. <laughs> smug, middle class, sitting down to your granola and blueberries every morning. I know the sort. And, but sadly, six out of 100 will get bowel cancer during their lifetime. We'd expect to get that, even that. And let's compare it with 100 slobs with their e sitting down every single day of their life to a great big three rasher, greasy bacon sandwich. That's how many will get bowel cancer, according to IARC's shock report. Okay, that, that's the one. That's the, one. That's the 18% increase over the six percentage points. So it's one extra. So 100 people are going to have to have that every day of their lives, that one extra case. So I call that, n the 100 is the number needed to eat. <laughs> ah, somebody got it. So you have to, <laughs> and there's only some people who get that joke, usually, because it normally it's the number needed to treat. Okay, so, um, so that's, you know, a good way to illustrate it. And I must say, um, w statisticians, when this story came out, were bombarding, you know, media outlets with this uh, uh, representation. And by the 6 o'clock BBC News, this story, it was being reported in this way. This would mean that 100, you, know, you get one extra bowel cancer case out of 100 bacon eaters over their lifetime. And it was in there by, by the 6 o'clock news. And it was on the BBC online website as well. So you can do it, but you know, it's, you're just fighting against this sort of um, entrenched refusal <laughs> to engage with the public, with, with what people will actually understand and take away with it. Uh, an absolute refusal to shift from ways in which things have been done in the past. And, well, as you know, if we have it with direct-to-consumer advertising, of course, this stuff is, is, can just be let loose um, for your favourite statin, having its 36% relative reduction but, you know, to be given their due, if, you've got, if your eyesight is good enough, you can look at the small enough print, and it says that, that means in a large clinical study, 3% of patients taking a sugar pill or placebo had a heart attack compared to 2% taking Lipitor. 
or alternatively, you know, 100 people will have to take that every day for five years to prevent one heart attack or stroke. They could have said that as well, but they didn't want to. I wonder why not. So, and this is so well known. This is, you know, the Association for the British Pharmaceutical Industry has said you should not, you know, it's part of the code of practice not to just use relative risk to communicate. And it's so well known, and yet it just carries on. You know, it's just, you just go on and on and on. Now, why should we be concerned about this, um, about this sort of communication? And I just feel that the time, you know, as I said, it's been going on for 40 years, people have been going on about this stuff. I, do people know about the Montgomery judgment last year? Now, this is a really interesting one. This is some guidelines just come out from the Royal College of Surgeons reflecting the Montgomery judgment. And um, this replaces the Bolam test for getting patients' consent to surgery. The Bolam test used to be that you had to explain things to surgeons to the degree that your, re your peers would consider reasonable, that you'd done a reasonable job in explanation. That's now been overturned in this court of, uh, this case of Montgomery versus Lanarkshire, in that it has to now to be explained not to the extent that your peers would consider it reasonable, but that the pa it must take into account the um, concerns of the patient it, it, now it, it, what's concerned is that uh, you must explain things so that a reasonable, a reasonable peer would um, think that you had adequately taken into account the, p the individual concerns of the patient in front of you. In other words, what was important to them? Which I understand from my clinical colleagues is you know, a sign of extremely good medicine to ask people um, you know, what's important to you. It is a very good sign in order to sort of counter this um, immediate response of, well, doctor, what do you think I should do? And the counter would be, rather than just telling them, say, well, what's important to you? And now that's enshrined in law, certainly for surgery, and this is going to change the surgical practice for getting informed consent. I think, this is the, I think this is an idea that goes beyond surgery, I think it goes beyond medicine, it goes be into politics, essentially. I think that we as citizens should be entitled to know about the benefits and harms of alternative policies taking into account our own feelings and what's important to us, not just what the great and good think are important. So, okay, well that's the Montgomery judgment. So, can we do things better? What we want is, you know, in my you know, ranting old man style, I think, you know, we want some balanced communication. We, you know, we, it doesn't mean having, balanced communication is not the, t the today program idea of balance. I mean, one person each end shouting at each other, <laughs> each throwing their number, their own number at each other my number's bigger than your number. It's completely pointless. Doesn't it, it just brings the whole edifice into disrepute. Now, it means, as the uniform reporting, that the harms and the benefits are treated with equal emotional and framing salience. We are not trying to make things look big or small. And this, you'd say, oh, well, that's obvious. Well, oh, what's so difficult about that? It's incredibly difficult. It's incredibly difficult because we all suffer from what's known as the affect heuristic. Whatever we're talking about, whether it's a new drug, whether it's a treatment, whether it's radiotherapy, whether it's um, fracking, whether it's GM, we have a feeling about it. Oh, I don't like the sound of that. I don't like that. We, ooh, I don't like that. We, we just have this sort of, you know, we have a, a feeling about it, and that influences our beliefs about its benefits. If we don't like it, we, we, don't, we downgrade its benefits and increase it, our feelings about its harms and so on. It, it, it affects our whole perception I, and which we claim is our knowledge, but in fact is being influenced by our feeling. So we are very complex and difficult things, and I am, you know, I'm hopeless. I have no ability to do balanced judgment on my own intuitively. Completely hopeless. I just go with my guts all the time. So I'm, I'm, I'm the worst example. I use myself as a, as a, a lovely example of how not to be and what I'm trying to counter as myself. So, um, okay, how can we try to do it better? And uh, I, was, I had a great privilege to work on the new cancer screening leaflets, which came out in 2013. And um, they were a, a real joint effort, um, but the, the of, of patients, and doctors, and nurses, and statisticians, and psychologists, and things like that. But a crucial thing is that right from the top, it was Mike Richards from his cancer czar, said that given that cancer screening, especially breast cancer screening, had been so contested, I don't know if you know, but you know, it's been a deeply contested really vicious area of science where the, the, you know, and with everyone throwing their statistics at each other all using different metrics and things like that very difficult to sort out very contested indeed and he um, you know said well, okay this and cervix and bowel would be based on a new principle they're based on consider the offer of treatment of, uh, of screening present the pros and cons they won't recommend screening and it'd be based on this idea so i think these are probably some of the few screening leaflets in the world 
that don't recommend screening. They just say consider the offer. And um, I, 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 I found it very impressive working with them. The other crucial thing is that they were driven by public engagement. They were driven by the audience, by what they wanted, how, what they understood, how they liked to see things. And, um, and that was very moving to present people with things and say, what do you like best? And what was great is that they chose the things that I would have wanted them to choose. So, for example, when describing um, mammograms, how to interpret, you know, uh, uh, what, what happens to the mammary, or how the results of a mammogram, there's no mention of accuracy, no mention of sensitivity and specificity, all this nonsense that no one understands, nothing to do with that. What you do is go straight for what people really want to know, which is what happens if I get a positive result? What does that mean? So you all it, and then it's interpreted, not, again, not in terms of chances, but in terms of what's known as expected frequencies. What would it mean for 100 people? So 100 women going from a mam mammogram, 96 sent home, you're tickety-boo, reassured, you're fine. Four need more tests, but most of those won't have cancer. These will be um, you know, just recalls. Doesn't mean you've got cancer just because you've got a recall. Some will, sadly. So, I mean, it's, a, it's an obvious idea, but you know, put like in this way, it suddenly makes it very graphic and very interpretable and, and friendly, and uh, it's great, I think. Um, this was another expected frequency tree showing the long-term impact of a screening program, uh, looking at 200 women going for screening, um, 12, we let 15 develop breast cancer, 12 treated and survived, three sadly die early from their breast cancer. 80% survival, fantastic net achievement, going up all the time. 200 women not going for screening, same number get breast cancer, eight treated and survived, four die early from their breast cancer, one extra death among the 200 women got not going for screening. However, the difference is that three of these women will never know they got breast cancer. They'll have a form that's not clinically apparent, that would only be picked up by screening. If they don't go for screening, then we won't know they've got breast cancer, and they'll be fine. So what that means is that the breast cancer treatment program, for every death, you know, life saved in a sense, three people are treated unnecessarily. And uh, those numbers are in the, um, uh, are in the leaflet. The fact that this means 4,000 women being treated every year unnecessarily uh, is in the leaflet. 1,300 lives saved is in the leaflet. All those numbers are in the leaflet. Um, the, the picture isn't in the leaflet. <laughs> got taken out at the last draft, which I was a bit sad about, a bit grumpy. It is quite a complicated picture, I admit it. I think it could have been in the back for those who wanted to see it. That's what I was arguing for. Can't we just have it at the back? Can't we just have layers? You know, you can't try to get everything. So anyway, I lost that argument. But never mind. But it, it, what it did reveal to me is what I consider a numeracy paradox about communication, is that leaflets are optimized for a reading age of 11, and a numeracy probably about the same. And, um, and this is fine, right? We want to open things out to people. But <coughs> if, we're really if we're serious about shared care, informed choice, opening things up to people to allow them to introduce their own values, whatever, then maybe this isn't the right way to do it to have this very low level stuff because partly um, there's some evidence that low numeracy people we tend to avoid shared decision making compared with, um, so, uh, so uh, what I call the paradox is that the, the leaflets are written for people who don't want to read the leaflets. <laughs> and the answer to that paradox, of course, is to have multi-layered communication. Not to, not to try to do one. A leaflet is a tricky thing, but you could at least have a bit at the back for those who want to know more, but basically not try to do it for more. But actually, uh, can I do a little psychological experiment first? Um, no, 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 I won't go. I will, I'll, I'll, I'll just go on a bit before I do my experiment. Just, to, just a little aside. Um, this business of using expected frequency trees, of saying what does it mean for 100 people to, what does it mean for 100 people eating bacon, what does it mean for 200 women, is, is fantastic. I mean, it's the way medical students now have been taught to do their risk communication, 100 people like you, 12 will have a heart attack or stroke in the next 10 years. And it's now in the GCSE math syllabus. Um, a group of us, me included, but a number of us campaigned for this, and now that's in the GCSE math syllabus. Um, because we really think that kids should be able to do this. It, it is such a powerful tool. It's how I do my probability calculations now, is to say, what does this mean for 1,000 people? And I do everything in that, in that framework. So. Um, I, th the problem is that when, we, when it, the teachers then said they didn't have any material, so we've written a book on this. Um, so it's a book for secondary school probability on teaching probability using these ideas. Okay, so um, yes, no. Let's do, can I do a little bit of research, <laughs> a little bit, of, um, a little bit of um, propaganda. Let, let's say, um, how long have I got? I don't. I'll just carry on. Okay. Um, okay. Let's say I've got too much more. 
Um, let's say, okay, uh, I think I'm going to take for granted that if you were facing a medical decision, you'd quite like some balanced information, the benefits and harms of the options. Is that right? You don't just want to be told, take this. <laughs> okay. okay, now, you have been given, someone sat down, done the whole Montgomery business, asked what's important for you, given you the benefits and harms of different options. Now, there are two options, two paths you can take now. And I, I, they're a bit slightly archetypal. You could say, thank you very much for telling me this. What do you think I should do? Or you could say, thank you very much for telling me this. I'm now going to take this away and go home and think about it with my family. Now, they're, they're slightly extreme. You want, might want to do a mixture of the two. But th they do reflect two different sort of uh, tendencies. And no, there's not one is right, one is not wrong. Who is more of the, what do you think I should do? What, you know, what do you think I should do? Wanting a strong steer. And who is, I'd like to take it away and talk about it with my family. <gasps> How interesting. You're the, I don't know if I've told it differently, but you're the first, or usually the majority of, of, of audience will say, that, what do you think I should do? Want a very strong steer. In, they, want, they want the audience, the information. Oh, I wonder, I think you're different. I think you're a different, more you're a different group of people. I think maybe you are, if you're a pharmacologist, you are. I think this is a different, that's the first time I've seen a majority who wanted to take it away and discuss it with their family rather than be told, you know, not just told what to do, but given a strong steer. I mean, I think it's everyone's right to say, um, I don't know, and, and we could talk about this in questions later, but I've already heard, there's so much informal discussion of the problems people are having now when actually being the, the choice being passed to them about their medical treatments. But we, I won't go on to that. Too. Okay, let's just whip through very quickly people who in your area, drugs and things, have tried to do some of this stuff, have tried to do transparent, unbiased um, communication. An example I used to go is the Steve Lotion and Lisa Schwartz's idea of a drug fax box. It's very simple, really. It's just saying, you know, what does it mean for people to, with a placebo? What does it mean for people with a drug? Listing the benefits, listing the harms, and just making a comparison between the two. In this one, they were both using percentages, 2% and 2 in 100. The big dispute about should you say 2% or 2 in 100? I'm, I'm not going to make a big thing about it. <coughs> um, so the drug facts box. Now, the drug facts box, they managed to get into the Obamacare Act, that the FDA were going to consider producing these as, uh, as uh, they were going to evaluate its role in, in um, patient information. And the FDA has just dug its heels in there, hasn't really gone ahead on that. And so Stephen Lee has actually formed a company now in formulary where, where you actually have to pay and register to get these drug fax boxes. It's an extraordinary effort. Um, here's a free one on the female Viagra. But again, where they're showing um, I, I, it's too small to read, I know, but it's about you know, the placebo, the main one. They're using it now just percentages, more, and they give a, a sort of conclusion, more you know, serious side effects, more women had severe drowsiness. 21% taking the drug, 8% against not. And, that, and, and for the benefit of, the difference was with the drug, the female Viagra, one more satisfying sexual encounter per, um, hang on, per month, as opposed to a half more satisfying sexual encounter with placebo. So with the drug, you get a half of a satisfying sexual encounter <laughs> per month. So, <laughs> so you have to decide whether that's worth the side effects. So, but, the, but the gist is there. You know, it's, 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 it's up front there. Now, and there's been so many, I mean, what am I looking at here? The International Society for Pharmacoepidemiology, their BRACE project, the UMBRA project, the BRAC project. There's so been so many projects that I've been vaguely concerned with for decades within the pharma, within pharma industry and elsewhere, trying to produce quite simple representations of the benefits and harms of alternative drugs. And these have gone, uh, many of you will know more about this than I have. I've just been, I, I suppose, find it slightly frustrating how these have gone on and on and on and not made the impact into the regulatory in regulation, regulators as they much have. So, you know, for the FDA, they're still fussing on and, you know, producing some benefit, you know, exploring the use of benefit risks, summary assessments, and they're still doing that. And the EMA is a bit better now um, in that they do produce um, some, uh, so for their summaries, for their public assessment reports, their public assessment reports, some simple tables for, so here's for, um, um, uh, what's it, uh, elotuzumab, how do you spell it, how do you say it, Elot? Elotuzumab? Elotuzumab? Elotuzumab. Yeah, okay. Okay, so this is a very recent one. It's only approved, I think, in May or something like that. And um, 
So th this is a summary, you know, it's supposed to be an easily interpretable summary report in a standardized format. So that for all drugs, new, new approvals will have a table like this um, in which you can see both the, that's the favorable effects and the unfavorable effects in the treatment and the control and uh, with some comments and a whole lot of text below. I mean, it's not wonderfully friendly, but at least it's putting there in a structured format so we can actually make the direct comparisons and maybe even visualize the, the, the eventually the harms and benefits of it. So, um, you know, so what's the best way to do this? Uh, to communicate benefits and harms. I said, people have been going on for ages, and I'm not going to start going through every study of, of, of the research on this, um, because there isn't one right, there isn't the right way. Um, people always say, oh, what's the best way to do this? Do we use percentages? Do we use graphics? Do we use... No, there's no right way to do any of this if you want to communicate to the public. The crucial thing is, you know, who are you trying to talk to, and what are you trying to do? Are you just trying to get just the gist, or do you want them to actually get the detail? Is this for professionals? Is it for patients? There's no answer. The, the crucial thing is to iteratively refine and, and work on it so that um, you make sure you know, you're doing what you're supposed to. Essentially co-production. So the real answer is that there's no correct um, um, way to communicate, but there is a correct way to develop your communications. And that's the lesson, I think. So, um, but people endlessly have tried to look at how best to present benefit risk assessments as the big predict, protect study EU funded that's working with the EMA on this, comparing vast numbers of different ways of drawing tables and graphics, whatever, um, more stuff here. And, and the point is that they, you know, they write, they do all these reviews, and you know, with this massive review and come up with what one might feel are not very impressive results. Um, here we are. Presenting numeric information appears to improve understanding of risks relative to non-numeric presentation. So numbers can help. Presenting both numeric and non-numeric information when possible may be best practice. Don't just give the numbers. And no single specific format or graphical approach emerges as consistently superior. And, and that's it. <laughs> so, you know, th that's the sort of lesson, that what you get from massive amounts of work and uh, things. So the, it's, it's almost reassuring is that there's no perfect answer to this. And it does mean it's open. This is, if you want to know, if you were, though, want to get some wisdom on this, I'd go to this one, this paper. It's a lovely paper, free, freely downloadable. Um, this is a, a group of excellent people, all of this lot, great gang, presenting. If you want to talk about, you know, this is for decision aids, but for anything really about risk communication, this is just great. Beautifully written, beautiful summarizing. So, um, you know, I'm going to go through this quite quickly because this is it's very boring just to have lists of advice, but people might be interested. Use absolute risks um, when appropriate. Um, uh, crucial to be clear about the... Um, Use chances of proportion of frequency of percentage. It's not quite clear whether you should use 2 out of 100 or 2%. The crucial thing is to be clear about the reference class. I'll come back to that in a moment. Beside uh, frequencies, both with and without the outcome. Keep the denominator fixed. Don't avoid 1 in lots of 1 in Xs. Don't say, oh, 1 in 10 compared with 1 in 100 or 1 in 50. Confuses the people here. Fix this about the time interval. Comparators can give an emotional response. You can do more if you want. So I won't talk about those in particular. Actually, the one I will talk about, though, is this one, which is lovely. The, the reference class. This is the fact that if you just quote a percentage, people can understand what it's a percentage of. The crucial thing, what is it a percentage of? And uh, it, it happened when I was working on the Sex by Numbers book, and I gave a, 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 less, a lecture with um, um, uh, the people who developed the NatSal sex survey, and they said, um, oh, well, you know, 30% of young people now have sex before 16. And all right, okay, that's 30% of young people. Know. That appeared in the Daily Mail as 30% of all sex happens in people under 16. <laughs> really, really, it was that. And they said, I said it. <laughs> so I mean, it was a disaster. And they just got, you know, you know they're obviously stupid, but apart from that, you could technically, they got the reference class wrong. This was 30% of 30% of, of 116 year olds, 30% would have had sex. In not, it's not out of 100 sexual acts, 30% were in, were in under 16 years. So they just, they got the reference class wrong. And that's why it's so, so incredibly valued va for another reason for saying of 100 people, of 100 exes. Because then you make it really clear what you are talking about in those 100. So that's why I'm a big supporter of this expected frequencies thing. Um, now, again, you won't be able to read that, but I'll just talk about, uh, this has got that it's probably most sophisticated 
at the Cochrane Review, Interactive Summary of Findings Service. Now, this is not really directly aimed at patients, um, but it's one where they really have taken on board the idea of absolute differences um, per thousand people. You can click on these and get lovely little pictures showing the thousand people, the icon arrays. You get a plain language statement. Um, you can move, but you can get visual overviews. You get relative risks as well. And you get a measure of the certainty of the evidence based on the grade. So this, this one um, is really you know, going for the whole business. And it's, too, it's, it's, it's far too much for many people, I think. You know, uh, something at a slightly higher level than this would also be valuable as well. The crucial thing is you need multiple levels. You need something at the top, then you need something with the numbers, and then you need something with the uncertainties at the, you know, underneath for those who want to know it. So just then, oh, I'm coming, no, not too long then. So what are the right graphics? Because anyone will ask, oh, wha what do I do? Do you use a bar chart? Do I, do I have to use these little people? Do I, they, oh, no, no, no. As usual, it depends on the audiences and the objectives. The crucial lesson is not too fancy and not too clever. Don't have lots of whizzy stuff. You know, don't be too clever. You know, people have done experiments to show that putting animations in can make things worse when it comes to understanding. So, um, but, you know, one format will not suit it. You won't satisfy everybody. Whatever you do, you won't satisfy everybody. I, the, the, the lessons I quite like is a good table counts as a visualisation. A really good table. Oh, work of art. <laughs> Beautiful. Using words and numbers. Don't, numbers do not speak for themselves. They want, you want some good descriptors. Um, beware lots of uh, thousands of little icons all coloured differently with some key explaining what they are. It's disastrous. Um, no pie charts under any circumstances <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> bar bar I love bar charts. I love bar charts. Um, you can get the gist without seeing the numbers, especially comparative bar charts. You can see who's bigger than what and that sort of stuff, especially if you haven't cut the axes. You can get a really good without seeing any numbers at all. Beautiful. What's wrong with that? Line graphs can be okay, actually. Well explained. Survival curves. You can explain those. But try it. So the crucial thing is trying to tell a story, but not too affecting. You, don't want, to you want to rouse enough emotion to make people interested, but not so much that they either panic or, or get too upset or anything like that. So it's trying to keep the emotional response sort of under control. You need to provide a good explanation and test and test again. Okay, so I'd just like to uh, finish off just by giving a, um, an example of where we tried to do this. And this was reconstructing this um, clinical audit into children's heart surgery. Remember, I, I, I worked on this Bristol thing. I've been involved in this in years. You know, deeply contested area. Very, very um, strong, th rousing, very, very strong feelings. And um, a worthy report, but, and, and they've made an effort, but actually, it's not very readable at all. So we got a grant to actually reconstruct it into something, working with patients right from the beginning, Children's Heart Foundation, or, you know, families on this. And we've produced this, heart this, um, under this uh, children's heart surgery outcome data um, website, which you click on any time, have a look at it. It's rather good, I think I'm, I say so myself. But it's working with you know, psychologists and um, operations research people, Sense About Science doing the facilitation of children's charity. And um, I think it's rather good. But the crux of it is this table. And the patients like the table. They liked having a table. And, and this is really delicate stuff. This is the real data. These are the, these are the hospitals carrying out heart surgery in the country at the moment, last year. How many operations they did uh, in order of number, so the biggest, Great Ormond Street did 1,800, and how many died? 30, 30, 39, 20, 20, 20, 20 that's how many died. How many survived? And notice we use the survival rate rather than the mortality rate. So a little bit of framing there, but I think it was the right thing to do, and you'll see in a moment. So 98%, so top of the, well actually not top of the league table, um, Greg, if you really want the top of the league table, it was Brompton, 98.9%. Now, the crucial thing is to try to stop people league tabling these numbers and thinking that just because one number is bigger than another, it's disastrous because it's just not fair. Because some hospitals treat you know, worse patients than others. Birmingham, for example, um, is well known for taking on um, difficult patients. So what this, um, and we, we explained, spent ages, ages working on trying to explain this, is that we produce a predicted range. And this, this depends on, this, this is driven by the severity of the patients. And it's Birmingham's quite low, because its patients are so, um, so sick that you don't expect so many survivors. So the, these are the goalposts, but they're, they're goalposts individually for each hospital. And um, so they vary. So this is a measure of the sickness rate. Now, oh, could we spend say, we spent ages on this and then tried on the patients and they said, oh, I wouldn't go there. That's like being predicted a bad exam grade. And we said, 
No, no, <laughs> it's the complete opposite. It's nothing like being predicted are bad, is there? It's, it's actually saying this really good hospital is treating the sickest patients. So, you know, we made, you know, but, but it's only by listening you find out people's misunderstandings. They're thinking that that means it's a bad hospital. And actually, it just means it's a hospital that takes really difficult patients. So what you need to do for each center is look at where its blob is compared with the blue. So is it inside? If it's inside, that's, oh, pff, that's not very interesting. If it's up here, they're doing better than they expected, better than predicted. Birmingham said, um, what are we doing, Brompton, about that. <coughs> and, um, and we're looking for ones outside. Glasgow was, uh, uh, yeah, Glasgow was um, on the borderline, but not over it in that last year. Um, can so, I ask a yeah, yeah. There's a great ornament piece by me that you've got there. Yeah. I mean, that's a hospital that it seems to have a very high risk intake. Yep. Um, uh, yes, not as bad as Birmingham. Ah. Yeah, look, they're, they're, they're expected. Uh, it's. Um, uh, it's not as good as, whereas uh, Belfast is, is uh, uh, very, in a way, a low risk intake, very high expected yeah. survival. Yeah. But it's not, it's not taking the, um, it, the, the uh, yeah, I, I, I thought GOS would be down here somewhere. Ah. But it's not, it's not actually, yes, I, I thought. It's Birmingham that's taking the, um, the worst at the moment. They're Thank doing you very much. Yeah. So, um, I, and we, we, with a lot of working through, we found that we could get this both for the media and, and parents. We could explain this, but it's a lot of effort. And we also then produced a little video. Can I show, I'll just show you this little video um, briefly before, I, just, just be to show you the, uh, the kind of thing we tried to do. No, this, oh, sorry, can I pause? Um, this was the, uh, this is one for the advanced people who get, there's a, a very intro, simple intro video. This is one for people who really want to know more. So this is not, this is for people who really want to know where do those, uh, this is very sophisticated stuff. Not for everybody at all. You have to work quite hard to even find this video. To understand how a hospital is doing, we calculate the hospital's survival rate and compare this to its predicted range of survival. If the hospital is doing as predicted, then we expect the survival rate to be within the predicted range nearly all of the time. But how is the predicted range of survival calculated? we look at the children the hospital has treated. To make the numbers easy, let's suppose that the hospital has done exactly 100 heart operations. The NHS collects data on all children who have surgery, which includes things like age, weight, diagnosis, difficulty of the proposed surgery, and complicating conditions. All of these factors can affect a child's chances of survival. A statistical formula weighs up these factors for each child and calculates a chance of survival. We do this for all the children that the hospital treated. We cannot predict exactly what will happen to these children and sadly it is very unlikely that they will all survive. A plausible way for things to turn out is that two don't survive, giving an overall 98% survival rate. Given all the chances that have been calculated, another plausible result is that three out of these 100 children don't survive, giving a 97% overall survival rate. We can consider lots of other plausible outcomes for these 100 children. We calculate the width of the predicted range so that the overall survival rate for the hospital lies within it 19 times out of 20, given the chances calculated for these children using the formula. Let's watch this in action. We can keep on considering possible outcomes for these 100 children. We calculate the width of this wider interval, the extended predicted range, so that the overall survival rate for the hospital lies within it 998 times out of 1,000. Again, let's watch this in action. We now have the predicted and extended predicted ranges for the children treated at this hospital.
When a hospital does relatively few operations, unforeseeable factors have a bigger influence on the overall survival rate, and so it has a wider predicted range than a hospital that does more operations. The predicted range depends only on the children treated by a hospital. Different hospitals will always have different predicted ranges, since they treat different children. So if one hospital has a lower predicted range than another, it is only because it treated children with more complex medical problems. There's just a, there's just a couple of points I'd like to raise that, you know, that took a long time. I'm sure we haven't got it right, but it took a long time. And you just notice two things that we really fought over. What imagery do you put up when a child dies on a grid? And what do you call chance variation, that scatter of points? You know, the, the rand, what, what as a statistical, you know, I might call random error, or we can't call it that, can't call it luck or chance, or not even chance variation, can't call it binomial variability, can't use that. And so um, you don't notice that what we did, there's two things there. We used a white space for the child dying, and we used unforeseeable factors as the phrase for unavoidable unpredictability, binomial error. And the unforeseeable factors, I think we took six months just to choose that phrase <laughs> and test it. And we we're quite proud of it, unforeseeable factors. And so I use it. Okay, so, um, oh, I should finish, I should finish. Um, oh, I know, oh, I'm going to put up a whole lot of boring stuff now, saying, this is my manifesto, um, this, is what we, this is what I should be doing. Yes, look, we should be, have a right to get information that's transparent, not manipulated, um, uh, done in cooperation, good design. Yeah, usual stuff. So that's the motherhood and apple pie bit. Um, but the nice thing is that we've got money to do this. My hedge fund has given us a huge wad of money to form the Winton Centre for Risk and Evidence Communication. So we are now trying to work with people who want to do it on doing this kind of thing, on balanced communication. It's not trying to push somebody down one uh, route or another. Now, I, I could stop now. I've got a five minutes of jokes, or I could stop now. I'm sorry, I have run a bit long. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Do you mind, mind? You can talk to me after. Do you mind? Can I go for the jokes? Yeah. yeah, okay. Okay, the jokes was, the joke is to do with, I want to tell jokes at my expense. God, that's always a good laugh, isn't it? The joke was to do with this book, um, which came out in the summer. And um, uh, I, I won't, actually, I won't talk about this. This is quite good. This is a graph about how many people... How many sexual partners people report between 35 and 44? Okay, well, the joke there is that um, out of 2,000 people, you know, the most common response is one, number of sexual partners, very nice. And then it goes down, and then you notice it sort of starts getting a bit vague around about here. All the faces start blurring, and it starts <laughs> going 15, 20, it gets wow, 20, 30. It all gets a lot of rounding error here. <laughs> rounding. <laughs> Apart from... This guy's at 47. So I always, I always reckon he must have been a statistician. Actually, I would think of a statistician, but I don't think any statistician would ever have had 47 sexual partners. And of course, the point is that we had to, I had to cut at the axis here, because otherwise it would go off halfway across Mayfair for some of the respondents. <laughs> but the crucial thing is this business about people having less sex. That's the story I want to talk about. Now, this was found in the, in the National Survey, and um, when it was reported, it, everything is all reported about iPads in bed. There's the... There's the drove, I mean, this really serious survey, and all the coverage was about iPads in bed. <laughs> and that's what happens, because of the fall in sex. And that's the picture from their graph, and, and that's what that shows is that that's um, 1990, median five times, a f five times a month on a median for couples aged 16 to 44. 2000, four times a month. Um, 2010, three times a month. So when I talked about this at the Hay Festival, I made the slightly stupid comment that, well, this means by 2040, nobody's going to be having any sex at all. <laughs> and that this was, I didn't think it was just iPads. I thought this was, this was box sex, in fact, with the real blame for that. And I, I told that, and I thought, it got a lot of laughs. And, um, but a journalist in the audience didn't quite get the joke. And, and the next day, we had th I had this headline in the Daily Telegraph, <laughs> warns Cambridge professor. And, and, and the article said, you know, Games of Thrones are preventing British couples having much sex. Uh, this declining sex rates was very worrying. <laughs> and 96, if current trends continue, couples will not be having sex at all by 2030. <laughs> and I thought, oh, God, 40 years building up a reputation <laughs> <laughs> down the toilet in a week. And I thought, I, I wrote her a letter, and she changed the online version. I thought, oh, I can't be bothered. It's stupid. It's just, you know, tomorrow's chip wrapper. 
in the modern day, of course, this is not to my ship rapper, because the combination of Cambridge Professor Sex and Game of Thrones <laughs> means that everybody picked this up and they didn't bother to see the correction and they certainly didn't bother contacting me. So the next day, there's <laughs> article after article about Game of Thrones ruining our sex life. Couples will stop having sex due to the large rise in <laughs> TV ratings from Dublin. This is my favourite. Sex will be obsolete for <laughs> women's health. We've got a one lone scientist, me. And I, you know, at this point, you really start worrying. You think, what am I going to do? It's impossible to stop. It just goes blah like that. Nobody talks to you. Just this thing. Just pick off one story, just rewriting the same story over and over again. The one, oh, German, <laughs> and then went to Italian, <laughs> and uh, it always was my name on it, University of Fritz. As it came to you, the university is quite good. They're quite a good brand. They didn't care. Um, but the best of all was the, this guy, and he's the only person who got the joke. And uh, Game of Thrones killing your sex life, and he decided it wasn't. And he said, oh, well, look, you know, this is my, um, the graph that I've drawn, and the graph you know, that I've put up. The five times four divided by three. But he, rather cleverly, instead of, I extrapolated it forwards, but he, with a stroke of genius, <laughs> extrapolated it backwards <laughs> to zero, where at the start of the Christian era, people were having sex 200 times a month. <laughs> Which I think was the appropriate way to treat this whole story. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.